All right, what's up, punks? It's Shinobi. Uh, we're bringing you a special edition of Block Digest today uh, with Rodolfo Novak from CoinKite. So, uh, you know, he can say hi in a second, but sadly, it's just me and no para today because everybody's schedule is all wonky. So, uh, what's going on, Rodolfo? Hello. I'm using push to talk on this awful interface application that you forced us to use. But hello. Nice to be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I still have to make up my mind whether to use that the, the recording I made of all the, the desks and, and stuff getting knocked around is a funny intro. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> but uh, what's up, no cry? You know, you, you, can, you can get used to the Mamba. Uh, I, so Shinobi forced me to use the Mamba too, but he forced me to use Quad Card too. So, I mean, <laughs> so we are even. <laughs> See, my fascism has, a has similar benefits. user interface. Well, I mean, you know, Mumble is more like the first version of cold card buttons. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, let, 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 let's not shit talk version one. Ver version one always has issues. Okay, okay. Just one more question. I just, I was just over a dev meeting and one of my, dev David is going to, to go through some borders and taking some quote cards and he's asking if it's safe to to travel with the quote cards because they kind of look like a bomb i mean i don't know it doesn't look like a bomb at all it looks like a calculator i mean there isn't even enough room in there for explosive material so i i mean eh, i wouldn't be concerned i've traveled with like piles of them like pretty much like all major airports I, yeah you know it's never good to travel with your private keys <laughs> anyways i mean um but aside from that you know he could destroy the seed and then just put the seed back when he arrives new place that's the only suggestion i'd give yeah we just want to give uh give some code cards to to another wasabi developer that's that's why uh, it's it's for yeah, developing. I, I think you'll be fine. Like <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got worry. stopped because my my phone charger looked like a fucking bomb. Air quote when I I came back from Berlin last year. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. You can travel with it. Yeah, that's what I taught him to. Alrighty, so uh, yeah, I guess you know the f f first thing I, I kind of wanted to to dive into. Um, is you know the the overall like cold card design and uh, because you know i think the you know the most important thing that you do in this architecture is just kind of how you structure the interactions between the secure elements and the vanilla mcu so i mean just for people not already familiar with that uh you want to kind of like break down uh the basics of that yeah so we, we sort of went with this idea of, of using a very dumb secure element, right? So that you can't put a lot of stuff in it and sort of do malicious things in it. That the, that secure element really can only do um, storage, one-way counting, and, uh, you know, it's got HMAC and a few other little sort of crypto uh, accelerators in there. But uh, none of those are used for Bitcoin because uh, the crypto accelerators in pretty much every micro is closed source. So we don't want to do closed source Bitcoin because that's stupid. So uh, what we do is we have the whole firmware that runs on the uh, SE, on the secure element uh, open source. Uh, and then we do all the Bitcoin operations uh, on the, the open MCU uh, with open crypto libraries uh, so that essentially you could just sort of compile yourself, run it yourself, and then you don't have to trust us whatsoever on how this thing is running. Um, but I think there's a big misconception out there that, you know, like there is open source chips and non and closed source chips. No, pretty much aside from hobby projects, all micros are closed source, all of them. Uh, the difference is some of them will publish uh, more detail uh, 
uh, schematics of how they work, and some will publish less, but they're all closed. And unless you have, and even for the ones that publish the whole, every single gate on a spreadsheet, uh, unless you have an electron microscope, you can't really verify that there. So assume that, you know, those chips, um, you know, could be doing something nefarious. So what you do is you run your own uh, open source uh, uh, stuff on them uh, to essentially make sure that they're doing what you want them to do. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I've always kind of thought like it, it was silly <clears throat> to, to make the argument that the, the chip is open source, you know, not not to knock on like any specific company on the space but it's just like that like who out there in, in normie world can verify that this chip in this device is actually what it claims to be like i can't do that and i think i have a pretty good grasp on shit it's it's sort of marketing bullshit right started by one of the the biggest uh, hardware wallet makers that you know they use uh open source chips no their chip is not open source uh, the schematics are sort of, you know, out there, but the chip itself is not open source. You're just running open source firmware inside that chip. That's the reality of this. Um, the, you know, the, the manufacturer is not going to give you an x-ray of their die uh, for every single chip for you to verify. Mm -hmm. So sorry for my, I mean, not understanding the historical context, but so what you hear uh, here and there is that some people say Ledger is not open source. Uh, and when you read the first, let's say, Reddit comment there, then it's going to say some parts of Ledger is not open source, uh, the secure element. Uh, can you, could you explain this? What what's what's really going on here? Because I, I have some confusion. Yeah, so no, so it, it is pretty confusing. With... So, all right. So, so Trezor has uh, you know open source uh, firmware, right? That they load onto their micros, uh, but it does not have a secure element. Okay. So, and then Ledger actually is fully closed source. Uh, they have uh, the, the there is a, the firmware. Yes, everything is closed source on, on on Ledger. The difference is, so Ledger pays to get certified, right? So when you have a secure element, some secure element manufacturers will not let you open source your firmware. It's part of the contract you signed to use those chips, right? Uh, so they they made a, an architectural choice to use a secure element that won't let you open source, right? So their firmware is fully closed. What they do is they get a, a sort of third party to audit their code and, and certify it, right? But then you're trusting essentially them, right? To me, that's a no-go. You know, th this is a personal preference thing, right? Uh, but, you know, but the Ledger guys do have like high quality sort of uh, like people there working on their stuff. It's not like, you know, it's like some sort of teenagers just hacking some stuff together. Like they, they're pros, uh, but it is fully closed and you have to trust them. Now on the on the Trezor side, uh, it is open, but uh, they don't have a secure element. So essentially Trezor has no security. Um, it, it's essentially impossible to secure a non-secure element. That's why they keep on getting uh, ROM dumped and all that stuff keeps on happening to them. Uh, that architecture, in my opinion, sort of has really very little hope in terms of physical security. So what we did was we sort of went in the middle. We found a secure element that we can open source the firmware and we have a open MCU uh, that has, you know, the right amount of memory and processing power to sort of do all the operations. So. So it is possible to make a hardware wallet that has a secure element, so it's actually secure, um, and is fully open source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's kind of what you know personally drew me to the, the cold card in the beginning. But you know, you, you mentioned um, you know the Trezor uh, vulnerabilities as far as 
<clears throat> the the rom dumps and the, the long history of attacks and like that that kind of comes down to like physical security and my issue with like their whole strategy on things is <clears throat> in my opinion in the long term all that matters is is physical security like in, in my mind the idea <clears throat> that you know you're just protecting keys from remote attacks like that's done that's solved like that's not a problem anymore the, the real problem in the long term is is people coming after you physically so like well, what have you guys done in the the cold card to really kind of protect against those attacks like i know you've iterated a few times on that um since version one yeah so uh version one and version two of cold card um so version one of cold card is sort of not as definitely not as secure as uh version three uh it, it is fairly secure it is uh but you know it still doesn't have like i wouldn't consider it fully physically secure it is much more secure than say a trezor right but it's not like to the spec that we wanted um mostly because because when we started that project, the, the secure element that we wanted was not sort of fully available in the way that we needed it. So with Mark III version, uh, it is physically secure because we are able to do the things we need to do to keep it physically secure inside the secure element, right? So, uh, and also even if the secure element gets compromised, we use one time pad to store your secret inside the secure element. So good luck with that. Um, now there is more to to just somebody physically attacking the device by trying to peel it or sort of like rom dump it right um other things that uh, a secure element provides you with are one is a, a monotonic counter right so you can really guarantee the device will break itself if the amount of pin attempts crosses a threshold right you can guarantee that because that calculation is done inside the secure element and then uh, you get, for example, side channel attack defenses, right? Remember way back in the day, I, I can't remember, I think it might have been Trezor that uh, they were leaking uh, private key calculations through the power yeah. supply, right? So, you know, you are vulnerable to that kind of stuff. And, and you know, they, they patched it and, and, you know, it was improved. But the problem is if you're not using secure element, it is hopeless. Right. There's always going to be another way that somebody's going to find to sort of get the stuff out because those chips were not designed to hold secrets. So you need a secure element. Um, and that's why the, the ledger, uh, even though it is closed source and unfortunately you can't trust because it's closed source, um, does have protections against those hacks. You know, listen, every single wallet is vulnerable. Uh, eventually bugs are found and you know they will be fixed but um if you start with a much stronger foundation of a secure element uh it gives you a lot more sort of uh out like uh baked in defenses against a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. yeah i mean like you know the the first you know to pick on you a little bit like the Actually, the only vulnerability I've seen for the, the cold card so far um, was the version one where um, I think it was Lazy Ninja dropped the uh, the trace in between the MCU and the secure element and was able to kind of bypass the, the rate limiter for the pin. And even then, if you followed the, the recommendation with the pin length, um, that, that would still take, you know, what, what was it, like a month or two? To brute force so actually give you some time to, to notice it's missing and actually move your money yeah i mean i i don't think it was good enough and that's why we simply you know improved the the design of the pcb to make it incredibly harder to do that on the second version and then we added the epoxy on top of the secure element uh but again you know we 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 don't believe in just, you know, creating some marketing around that and sort of like, oh, look, it's finally improved. No, we just, you know what, that much better to improve the security by changing the secure element to an even better one so that we can do uh, um, the, the, the pin calculation of trials inside the secure element with the monotonic counter. So then there is no, that attack is simply not possible anymore. Um, unless somebody find a vulnerability on the actual secure element, uh, good luck with that. Um, 
Yeah, I just, so, so I yeah, just wanted so, to point out that like the the one vulnerability yes. that's hit you guys so far it was nowhere near uh, as bad as, as some of the other yeah. ones on other products. It's because we get you know we, we use a secure element to do the secure element's job, which is to hold a secret, right? Um, so I think you're gonna find you know people are always gonna find vulnerabilities on cold card. You know, it's normal. That's how you improve a product, especially for security, but. I think it's going to be a lot harder to find catastrophic vulnerabilities on a device that uses a secure element and has the firmware open source. So, you know, we, we, we are in contact with a lot of secure security researchers. There's a lot of people trying to break cold card now for, I don't know, two years now. I, I forgot how long it's been around, maybe a year and a half, two years, two years, right? So anyway, sounds right. It doesn't matter. It's been around. Uh, people are trying to break it, um, and so far, uh, it's been <laughs> it's been holding its own. Um, and, and I think another fundamental difference is we we don't believe a hardware wallet should ever be connected to a computer if it doesn't if you don't want it to, right? So being truly air gapped um, also really diminishes the, the attack surface for remote exploits, right? Because let's say that there is a flaw in the device and then the attacker manages to sort of, you know, take over your computer to exploit that via the USB, right? If you're not connected via the USB, then you're truly air gapped and, and that remote retrieval of the exploit will be substantially harder. Essentially what air gapping, true air gapping does is you'd have to be physically uh, attacked in order for that exploit to be exploited, right? Um, I've heard a few sort of, you know, other hardware wallet makers sort of say that USB is air gapped and, and you know, it's not. <laughs> uh, that's, that's cute, but uh, you know, air gapping means there is literally just air around it. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that logic, um... Yeah, that that to me, it just like I don't think they're they're really thinking through what they're saying when I when I hear those things, you know, because it's like I've I've seen the the same kind of statements where because you're using the SD card, it's not an air gap, and like I don't think they appreciate the the difference in a fully open, like effectively um, bandwidth not constrained connection over a USB cable versus that SD card where you can only like get so much into the actual memory on that device to try to to run an exploit and like it is so much more constrained in what you have to work with there yeah so you you gain two things right one is that it's not remotely retrievable right the or remotely attackable because it's not connected to anything um, another thing is you cannot do side channel attacks as easy right like that trezor attack through the via power supply Right, because it's not connected to the computer. So if you were using a altered computer, altered USB hub that could uh, say read the, the power levels on the device in a more advanced way, it's not super easy, but you know, you could do it that. Uh, now, if you're using a, a dumb power pack, right? Uh, with the device, it's much harder to do any side channel attacks unless you're very close. Now, the micro SD though, this is not like micro SD is like, like a computer, right? This is a very restrained, small library. <laughs> the micro SD driver is only 252 lines of code. That's it. So you could inspect that yourself. Uh, and uh, also we don't really execute anything from the micro SD card, right? We're just reading very specific data uh, that we expect to read. So it's not like putting a USB drive inside a computer, right? The USB stack is a monumental disaster on a computer. Uh, that's why there are so many attacks, uh, attacks that you can do to it. Um, so, so that's sort of where it's at in terms of, of that part of the, the security architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you've, you pretty much preemptively, uh, just removed as much attack surface as possible. It just it, like not even wait and until it's an issue or a problem. It's just like, no, let's just make this not possible now. Yeah, because you will be an issue eventually, right? I mean, you, you have to assume that 
an attacker somewhere, especially one not interested in doing responsible disclosure, right? Uh, we'll try to exploit this. Um, so why get people that, you know, it's trying to hold their savings on the device to, to expose themselves anyways, right? So let's just cut that thing completely. Um, but, you know, if you want to use your card for, say, you know, your warm wallet or whatever, you know, by all means, use the USB works just like Trezor and Ledger with, you know, uh, Electrum or, you know, Core or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you want that extra, you know, protection layer for your cold storage, it's like, you know, I, I have literally never plugged mine into a computer and I'm never going to. And I just love that. I mean, it's pretty cool, right? Because you can have, say, the, the device, you know, stored someplace remote that doesn't even have internet or anything. You can just bring your micro SD card, right, with you with the PSBT in it, go there, sign it, right, completely offline, completely remote, and then come back to the place to broadcast a transaction, right? So, like, you can really put some distance in between things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, no part. Do you have any... Uh questions you want to ask before I kind of shift gears a little bit? Yes, I, I want to ask one question that so now you feel pretty confident about the security of court card MK3 uh, and what's the future direction? Are you putting court cards into laptops and mobile phones? Uh, so I, I think I'm pretty comfortable with the security in terms of, yeah, you know, I think we've reached a, a level of security now that uh, it's, a, it's a good place to sort of remain for a while and see what the security researchers and everybody else sort of comes up with. Um, there is always more stuff to add. So, for example, we want to start logging uh, the every single interaction that the device makes inside itself, encrypted. So... If there is ever an event, an attack or something, at least we could review all that. Uh, that'll be pretty cool. Um, wow. Yeah, so so then th there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, like, you know, for example, the, the address explorer that uh, Holdawave actually took on himself, so we, we didn't have to make it. That was great. Uh, so for example, code card is the only hardware wallet that you can actually review the addresses in the device as opposed to uh, trusting the computer or just the address on the screen. Uh, you can actually explore, transverse the whole um, derivation path. Um, and uh, it, it's really sort of, we're gonna keep on adding features that are useful uh, in terms of security and, and sort of usability as opposed to stuff that sort of like is great for marketing. <laughs> um, and uh, I think next uh, we're, we're adding uh, Shamir shares. Uh, I unlikely to be slip 39. Uh, the, it's too memory intensive and got other issues that essentially not our preference. So we're going to just do our own thing. Um, and uh, I want to I want to make the open dime have a different mode so that you can run it as a HSM and cosine transactions uh so you can have a secondary or third sort of thing that essentially just leave it leave that connected and it just sign or cosine transactions based on a policy inside the device so you can say say just one bitcoin every tuesday right and the device will be connected to a computer and you know that's not for your hodl right like that's either to cosign your hodl or to just sign say for example join markets right um, I I really dislike using all the 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 coin join applications because the keys need to be you know hot. So we're we what we're looking into how can we make a cold card have a separate firmware or different whatever how we can do so people don't mix 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 up their stuff so that you can run that cold card connected to a computer and call sign or sign stuff. Uh, there's a lot of useful stuff in that. Um, what else? Uh, there is, you know, we eventually want to sort of work on, on the industrial design a bit more, you know, improve it, sort of take it to the next level kind of thing. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, we're gonna keep on adding stuff. You know, people keep on buying, we keep on making it. That's the mentality. <laughs> Yeah, dude, yeah, I love the 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 coin join um, firmware idea, but I, I want like go back to the the event log on the device like that. It would be amazing for any kind of sorry, corporate. I missed that. What would you like? The the event logging like that would be amazing for any kind of corporate or institutional use because like now you don't just have the the blockchain history. Of, of stuff going on you actually have the the history of signing of, of your key device to audit as well so you can take like a auditing to an event to a whole new level like it's not just oh those coins moved it's like where did that get signed like what point in, in the the key management process were we compromised yeah no that that's the idea right it's like really i, I mean we're bringing we're sort of working on security tools for need as opposed to want, right? So people want many things, uh, you know, because they're cool. Uh, we want to get there too, but we sort of really focus on, um, we really focus on, on trying to, to make the stuff that, you know, <laughs> people or we really actually need. Uh, so, so yeah. Yeah, it's, we we can get into all the the features I want that you won't won't give me to, towards the end. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, everybody wants features, right? Uh, but it, it's uh, memory is limited. You know, security is a concern, so you you have to be very very conservative uh, on how you build features for a hardware wallet because anything you do is one more opening right that's why for example no shit coins right that's just more cold to be reviewed and doesn't matter how much people try to justify that as like oh but we you know we can sort of keep this in a separate branch or whatever and you're still putting resources on it right it's still getting reviewed it's still more stuff to to write and read and test so things get lost it's just the nature of software right mm -hmm. yeah i would much rather you guys uh keep your your work concentrated on bitcoin <laughs> all right so uh yeah i, th I think i want to shift gears here a little bit and talk about supply chains because this this is something i think that like the vast majority of people in this space like don't really understand how big of an issue this is going to be in the long term i mean like if, if you just look back to just 2017 like the the amount of of nonsense all over places like amazon is insane like i, I literally saw people just selling usb sticks advertised as bitcoin hardware wallets <laughs> and so like when when we like really blow up in terms of like all the normies are rushing in like those supply chain issues that aren't really so bad now because it's just us us fucking goofs and weirdos here like th those are going to become massive because like the supply chain is going to expand enormously and like that's an issue that's going to affect everybody like w what happens when there's literally a million people storming into Bitcoin every day looking for a way to store their keys and these supply chains for all these wallets are just wide open attack vectors. So I think a huge problem is um, most of the hardware wallet makers sort of went with a reseller model um, and they sort of depend on that and that's why you see so much shilling right for those wallets on Twitter or whatever right because People make, you know, good margin on those wallets, uh, <clears throat> selling them, reselling them locally. And it kind of makes sense, you know, especially with shipping costs and all that stuff. Um, even though we do have people who buy and resell it, uh, we, we don't actually believe in official resellers. Um, I don't want to vouch for any reseller. I'm happy if they want to resell. And then the people who buy from them have local trust webs, right? So. If you know your local sort of Bitcoiner guy in your city and you know you trust him to buy your hardware wallet from him, well, by all means, right? Uh, 
that's actually not a bad thing. But I'm not going to put an official reseller list on my website because, you know, those could be uh, nefarious. They could turn nefarious or they could be accidentally nefarious, right? Uh, so that's one thing. <clears throat> Another thing is, you know, if you're interested in saving, you know, 10, 15 percent uh, by buying on Amazon a hundred something dollar device, uh, you, you know what? Like, good luck to you. Uh, you do not understand the concept of being your own bank. Um, the responsibility that comes with that, uh, you know, saving a few bucks to store thousands, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin is insane. Uh, so, you know, you should not care about spending, you know, a decent, you know, like amount of money researching and, and sort of securing yourself. Think of it kind of like, you know, it's like buying a $10,000 bicycle, you know, and, and putting a $10 lock on it. It's ridiculous, right? Um, so you have to secure yourself appropriately. Um, and another thing too is, you know, um, so you cannot control supply chain of uh, MCUs, really. Um, you have to have a secure element because secure elements are all like in individually identified uh, and they can keep that very securely as opposed to a general purpose mcu like one of the open wallets um and then you know they have to be manufactured in a country where you know we have laws and we have sort of reasonable um security and peace and, <laughs> and not a history of making fake stuff so you know we we make cold cards here in toronto uh 40 minutes from my house and uh, the secure elements are get shipped here from the factory and uh, and then we put everything together here and they get programmed uh, and, uh, and and then there is the shipping part of it right so you know putting a holographic sticker on a device and calling it a day is, is absurd because those are too easy to to forge and you know you can just buy it you know a bunch on eBay and they don't even have to look the same because people don't know the difference um so you know we don't have a perfect solution for that either but we do have a what i believe to be a better solution we use uh money bags uh these are used for banks when uh, they have to uh deposit cash at the back office so you know these are void uh, evident bags and they also have a, a serial number on them and then the serial number is burned into the secure element so that you can't really you know, it's much, it's just keep on adding more stuff, right? Security in that. So the idea is you just keep on making it more expensive for the attacker to try to uh, to, to get in, in between you and the user. Um, yeah, and I guess another issue too is uh, the, the activation of the device really is kind of like part of the supply chain. So uh, there are hardware wallets out there that need you to connect it to a computer in order to activate it, right? and need to sort of connect to their servers. That's also pretty absurd uh, because now you're leaking your unique identifier uh, to that web service and yay. Now, even if they're not nefarious, somebody in the network knows, now knows which wallet is yours, uh, which hardware is yours. Um, so that really goes into that idea of not ever connecting the wallet into a computer. Um, that uh, helps with many things mm -hmm. i mean yeah it's you know like I, I think you really hit the the nail on the head except for the the last mile to the the customer is really the only uh you know place i think i disagree with you there it's you know i think like really uh like the the bag kind of structure you do I think like ultimately like that's going to be need to wrapped again in that kind of protection just to get from like the, the actual supplier you to like another reseller. And like I, I think pr pretty much the the supply chain from the, the manufacturer to the actual end distributors uh, needs to work like um, moving cash between banks. Like that's, yeah, but that's the degree. Why but that's why, you know, I, I don't like the idea of resellers, just, you know, it's uh, in terms of official resellers, it's just, you know, we ship directly to customers from Canada. It's uh, yeah, <laughs> as I'm simple not, as that. 
like I'm not saying like official or, or anything. I'm just mean like in in general, like whether you're just a reseller doing it themselves or it's an officially notarized one, like that's the degree that you're going to have to secure that supply coming from the manufacturer to you. Yeah, and that's like, that's how it's done. So the, the devices don't leave the factory unless they are in the in this void bags. There's a void evident bags. No, but I mean, like, let's take that to a new level and a whole batch of, of cards gets wrapped in the same type of protection. So that, yeah. that batch is identified as well. Like, you know, I, mean? I, I think I think the issue is that you can't really fully trust the bags either. Um, you, you know, unless the person receiving it knows exactly what to look for, you, you know, every every single staff is sort of like has flaws. Um, I think we have uh, we have an idea for the next uh for the next hardware that uh, we're sort of playing with and if that works out it could get extra interesting but uh but this is sort of like there's never going to be a perfect or ultimate solution it's always going to be sort of like a rat race yeah. right uh so you know uh yeah I, I, and then there is cost right so to still keep the device in a certain cost i mean you know i can't you know, contact one of these sort of companies that make the ultimate secure sort of box for you to ship a military, you know, nuclear missile, sort of like uh, the, the, the launch code chips, you know what I mean? Like you can't charge a customer, you know, 2000 Five thousand dollars for the bag. <laughs> so, well, I mean, uh, at, at this scale, but I mean, you know, imagine if you are getting like tens or hundreds of thousands of new orders a day in ten years. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think I think we're gonna sort of work this out as the the scales increase, and, and we're gonna keep on sort of like doing what makes sense for that skill. Um, I, I'm. I think I'm pretty happy with like the current setup that we have uh, for for say that you know the next 10x for for Bitcoin price and, and interest, um, and then sort of like in between now and then we're sort of gonna keep on working on you know what's the next level of security we can go at that is like marketable price wise. Oh, I'm I'm glad to hear that man because it's like I. Every time I, t I talk about this at scale, it's it's like everybody's like, I haven't thought of this or why is that a problem? And it's just like that that is such an obvious potential clusterfuck just flying at us down the road. Like if this does succeed, which we all think it will, like this is going to be a major problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's really cool, though, is with scale comes so many options, right? Because say you know, Bitcoin market grows another 100x in terms of people, you know, and say we're doing well in sales. We could get to a point where it can just go and, you know, we'll make our custom chips. You know what I mean? We can make, we can start getting to a degree of, of customizability because of the scale that you would make it really hard for somebody to sort of, you know, get around that uh, uh, or at least get around that and not be evident because see that's like a very important part is like how can you make it evident that something was messed with you don't necessarily need to protect it to that degree you just have to make it evident yeah you know it's it's nothing can be perfect you just want somebody to to know like okay uh don't put my keys in here <laughs> yeah exactly all right i guess i no para uh you got one more question Yes, I have one more question. So you live in Australia, yes? No, Canada. <laughs> oh, sorry, Canada. Okay, so that's that's your home base. So you are, you you have a home there, right? Like you're not really moving around. No, I I live I live in the ether. No, I'm kidding. Yes, I have a home in Canada. So if you would be a digital nomad, a crypto nomad, meaning you wouldn't have a base, you would be going from country to country, how would you store your Bitcoins? I, I think uh, I think traveling with Bitcoins, um, you know, it's going to have to 
rely on passphrases or or empty devices and you're going to have to bring it in your mind or concealed in into i don't know like i mean you know you could put a micro sd card with your seeds encrypted in it and, and then put a bunch of pictures and leave it in your camera it's like you know it's very unlikely somebody's ever going to check that crossing an airport and if they do you know you could you could put the keys stenography into micro into pictures that inside the micro SD card and then you just carry an empty cold card or you buy a cold card and you send it to the destination you're going to um you know being a nomad and crossing uh crossing uh, unfriendly borders is never going to be an easy thing and you're going to have to sort of play to whatever uh degree of of interest they have in you um but uh, I think, uh, you know, like another thing you can also do that I think it's going to help a lot is, you know, once we have, say, co-signing, uh, ro- like self-rolled out co-signing services, right? So you're not really losing any privacy. You're using your own co-sign box in a different country, right? So you can do multi-sig. So even if they do get you, you, you know, like you can't really sign your coins, right? Uh, you could also do that. Um, I think different solutions for different people. Th- these things are never sort of like an easy answer. Yeah, th- thank you. It, it wasn't as easy. It wasn't an easy question. That's why I asked you. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a that's a tough one. It's almost like an idea for a new mnemonic scheme somebody had might help with that. <laughs> Nope. Oh, we're going to have to fight now. All right. So I, I think I think we're at that, that trolley point now, uh, Rodolfo, where, where I'm going to have to bother you about all the, all the features I want that you won't give me. We take PRs. <laughs> but, but, oh, yes. Okay. Wh- why don't you have your issues open on GitHub? Because I'm fucking lazy. No, because, oh my god, it's like, it's like, Just we, used to, we used to get a lot of, like, issues that are non-issues, right? Like, I think a lot of people earnestly want to help, or people want to sort of ask questions or participate, which is great, right? The problem is GitHub itself has very bad uh, uh, maintainer tools for issues, Right. So we don't want to put actual usable time into managing issues. Right. Um, they're very uh, non helpful. So we find we find that like having people actually put in the time to write exactly what they want or need or are willing to do to an email, send it to us. You know what I mean? Uh, sort of like really gets a lot more quality. Uh, uh, and usable feedback. Um, I really wish we could open the issues, but it's it's been uh, not great. I mean, we even got like somebody opened a, a PR to ask a question. Um, you know, again, it's it's maybe it's like we fail to make it easy for people to find the email to send a message, uh, but uh, maybe we can improve that. But so far. Unless GitHub gives me a way of deciding if an issue gets open or not open, right? So there is like sort of like a a, a purgatory, a limbo for issues that are not made by us. Uh, I probably won't open issues. Uh, I think other projects also have a lot more people contributing. Uh, So maybe they, you know, they do need it. Uh, We do have internal issues in a repo. Uh, that's that's for us to sort of, you know, un, uh, uncensor, uncensorly say the things we want to say, how we want to say it <laughs> internally is also great. Uh, I don't want to uh, have to sort of think about how I'm going to describe things or sort of use the kind of politeness that you need in an open uh, issue system as well. Um, yeah, we're trying to be productive. Uh, and uh, and all the people contributing to cold card cold base wise uh, have no that can reach us very easily and we sort of do you know we respond to email in like okay, minutes. Rodolfo, 
You can just admit it, dude. It's okay. You're just scared that if you open it, you'll get a hundred alerts from me a day, and you'll never sleep again. Not really, because I just block you. <laughs> I mean, I can very much relate to to the issue that that you just said because in Wasabi, I was considering maybe we should hire someone who can whose whose only job is to say no in a very polite way. And that would be all he's doing. I don't know. That that might be something to to consider. Yeah, I think uh, you know it's 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 like a, a blessing and a curse. Like Bitcoin has introduced like cold and and like GitHub to like a lot of people who are not necessarily technical, which is kind of fantastic, right? But that means also a lot of people that are not necessarily going to contribute get have GitHub accounts. Um, and, and they will sort of like put in a lot of effort into sort of participating. Uh, but a lot of times like participation is not necessarily productive. Um, you know, like cold card is not Bitcoin core, right? Like, so, you know, if you want to fork our stuff and, and do your way, you know, you can, um, and we don't have to remain in consensus, right? So we have a very authoritarian view of how we want to make code card, how we want to code it, how we want to, the next features. And uh, it's like, you know, you can choose to accept the way we want to do it or, or don't use it. I think that's pretty fair. Or just fork it. <laughs> Alrighty though. I was like, uh, when, when you get done with this, no farther, I seriously am going to accost him about some feature it's, proposals it's okay. on there. It's okay, go ahead. Okay, so let's see if I can be coherent this time, Rodolfo. Okay, so you know the feature uh, on the cold card where you can lock down the wallet so that it, it just burns the mnemonic words and only keeps the, the master key? Yeah, so it's like it's the BIP32 uh or bip 39 bip 39 uh it's essentially combines the passphrase and the mnemonic and it actually makes derives the private key from that the the, the master private key and then it leads the mnemonic from the device so the device only has the actual master private key yeah hello sorry all right no no it's fine okay but um Pretty much what what I want out of cold card is the ability to make a backup on an SD card of a wallet like that, where it's just gotten the master key for the passphrase wallet. And that's just like, that's the base level of that backup to import. Yeah, you into really another can do that. You really can do Wait, that. Wait, like seriously? Like I can, yeah. I can. Okay, then dude. Yeah, this whole thing has just been me reading because I didn't understand that. I just want to make slave wallets for my friends and family so that they don't fuck up and lose their coins. Yeah, no, you already can do that. So once you lock down the seed, you, you go into the micro SD uh, uh, like menu and you go back up and that's it. <laughs> okay, awesome. I have been reading at you for no reason for like a week or <laughs> two. I know that's why now I just go, uh, you know, write me a bip, Shinobi. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm going to eventually for this mnemonic idea, but um, yeah. So I, I next up, where's my damn open dime with the exposed public key, you son of a bitch? <laughs> oh yeah, so we've been meaning to do that. The the problem is like the cycle of open dime is like gigantic so we buy chips for open dime almost a year in advance and then they get programmed at some point in between like at a secure facility um because open dimes are not field uh, upgradable so we have to program the micros before they actually go on the board uh and then we do the pairing secret between the secure element and the uh, mcu and the open dime uh after it's been assembled so and another problem too is that like you know if we cause a bug on that thing it's like a whole production run just goes to shit uh so essentially not upgrading open dime is a feature <laughs> in a production level so 
I mean, we might uh, we might do more later eventually, but uh, we're really trying not to make any changes to it for a while. Okay, all right. That that that's actually a reasonable answer. It's just you know, I, I, I ever since you guys invented these damn things, I've just been looking at them and just wanting to make multi sigs out of them for like so many reasons just like cheap disposable multi-sig or you could make like a one of three multi-sig and then as I long as that idea but no, i'm no, just no, gonna no, put no, it no, out there dude, i hate it. it listen to me it. listen to me dude you could do a one of three multi-sig with a three set of open dimes and then as long as like a, an attacker doesn't have access to all three, they literally don't even have a way to know that that thing yeah, is capable but, of but spending. You, you're missing the whole other part, right? Like you're gonna have Who to have use you, it. <laughs> you're, you're gonna have to like create an application or write some soft. You're gonna have to write some software so that you can take a WIF format, uh, uh, private key, and sign, co-sign that transaction. I don't think you can even exists right now so there's a lot of software you're gonna have to write to, to make that happen so maybe once you make that software happen then maybe we do it uh because right you now if you do that. that you're not gonna be able to sign it you shouldn't have said that because now i'm gonna do that and you'll never hear the end of it until i get my open guidance with exposed pub keys i'm not making any promises but you help make the keys <laughs> Um, yeah, um, see, I'm a lot more, so for example, there is one more feature, I don't know if we ever made it public because it's not finished yet, but it was sort of like a mini side project that sort of just stayed, um, we're making the cold card be able to generate key pairs that are unrelated to its wallet so that you can make paper wallets or test wallets or whatever but you get just a secure made key pair and that might actually be more useful to you. Um, I like that feature, but no, I'm going to keep screaming. I want my open dimes. <laughs> but I, I do see, actually, do see? I do actually like that though. Like, cause you could, yeah, just generate things on the fly that you could dispose of or not have such a high degree of security around and not put, like your main stash at risk like yeah, yeah. like and, and yeah i mean if we can we're gonna do bip 38 on it i can't remember if we can or not Ooh. uh but uh the idea so for example you know like a lot of times you know somebody says like you know i am from the pineapple fund i'll send you 40 bitcoin <laughs> you know you 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 know you know f that's almost a hundred percent a scam, but you still want to give a correct address. You don't want to give a, a, a burn address in case somebody makes something funny, but you also don't want to dox your wallet. So, you know, in that case, you want to just generate a key pair, you know? Uh, I think, especially like for people who develop wallets or work in any Bitcoin development, it's so nice to get a quick key pair that, uh, that is not made on the computer. So you have some degree of trust on it. Uh, but you know, it's also unrelated to your holdo. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would just also be like a nice way to to be able. To, you you know, I think you're you're kind of fucking your own market here, Adolfo. Because like now, why do I need to buy an open dime to give my my normie friend Bitcoin? I can just generate one of these keys with the cold card I already have, and just give because them that. see, you're gonna be a thief, and you're not, and you're gonna have a copy of that private key, so your friend can never trust you. But dude, like the, all, all of my friends want me to be these. Like that. That's why I, I've been reading at you about that. That thing that the cold card can already do. Apparently, is like I, I'm finally at the point where like friends are coming to me. Like, okay, I'm taking the plunge. Like, you know, how do I do this shit? And nice. So you're gonna run a long <laughs> con, huh? No, it's just like I, I like you know these these are close people that i do not mind uh actually like helping manage their money uh that's not something i would recommend you do for everybody uh to any listeners out there uh but like i don't want to deal with the hassle of a million different seeds like just just give me the safe way to just all 
like branch off of my seed so I don't have extra shit to deal with. <laughs> I don't know if you want to do that with your R seed, but you want to might have like your friends one. That's your base seed. No, maybe I mean, that's, I, that's why like I wanted the whole lockdown thing with the cold card. Cause if I can lock it down with just like the master key for that on their device, like there's no way they can reverse that to any of my shit. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, that, that, I don't think that's possible. Uh, I Unless Google's quantum computer comes along. Yeah, two weeks. <laughs> like, it's so mind-boggling stupid. Like, it's like they got tired of VR and blockchain. Now it's like quantum is back again. Quantum computing, like, I think comes back every... It's like AI. Oh, actually, it was just AI recently, right? That we're all doomed, the world's going to end. Mm -hmm. It's like every every six months, you know, like, popular science needs something to talk about. Um it, it's just it's so annoying because it's so stupid but you know what every time it uh it, if it does have any effect on bitcoin price which i don't think it does anymore but if it does it's great you know uh cheap coins right here here all right so i guess i don't want one last uh relevant topic in my head and i guess then we can bullshit until that peters out but um well, what's the what's the game plan when when it when it comes to liquid? Like you you you're, you're kind of really slacking here in in helping our our uh, blockstream overlords private platforms take over the world, man. So it's really a dev time issue. So Mark Three now has like enough memory for their more complex transactions. So uh, as soon as a uh, blockstream is willing to. Uh, to, to get a dev on it, uh, our repo is open and we take PRs. <laughs> All right, so time to start yelling at the overlords. <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, we we totally want to, like, Liquid Network is a fantastic thing. It, it really is a remarkable project. Um, I, I believe, uh, you know, essentially like securities or whatever you want to call it, uh, however you want to see it, but the idea of tokenizing, you know, contracts, um, it, it's, it's, it's like, it's a very important part of financialization. So, you know, we have now hard money, but with hard money, you also need like, you know, contracts that can be traded between people and, and that trading has to be uncensorable. Um, so that you can have your stable coins, you can have all that crap. It's it's very important. Um, see, like uh, uh, an ICO per se, right? Like whatever you want to call it, um, is always going to be centralized, right? Because a company is centralized. Even if you can't technically make it decentralized, it's still stupid because it is centralized, right? Like there's a set of people who can make a decision on a, a project corporation or whatever you want to see as. What's important is the trading of those assets is done decentrally, yep. right? Uh, and, and that's why I like Liquid uh, so much. Uh, the, the Federation model provides the, exactly that model, right? Uh, I think Liquid really wins when you know all the dark markets have uh, dark pools between them, so you can trade your, uh, you know, <laughs> your dark your dark market <laughs> points between uh, uh, between dark markets, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I think the there there is a lot that can be done, uh, but it, it, you know, Ethereum does have a foothold on, on this crap. Uh, mostly because it's been around for so long, but I think with time and money, uh, a lot of those things will move into Liquid. And what Liquid really needs is a one-button ICO uh, uh, UI. So any scammer out there can press one button, put a name on it, and they can launch their scam ICO uh, on top of Liquid. We want to bring the scams back to Bitcoin because of, <laughs> you know there it's a lot of value. Yeah, if they're I mean, gonna do it anyways, do it on top of Bitcoin. The the one thing I'm waiting for people to realize is, uh, you don't need to go through the Liquid Federation to peg Bitcoin into Liquid. 
but I can I can spool up a liquid wallet right now, mint an asset, pull out my cold card, and I can be a way to peg into liquid just as easily as they can. Like anybody can. <laughs> All you need to do is issue an asset and handle deposits on the main chain. So it's like, yeah, that 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 platform, like the the base LBTC token is is pretty locked down by the federation, but that platform in general is absolutely not. It, it, yeah, I mean, what's cool is that, you know, if you don't want to use that federation, right, the the Blockstream federation, I'm sure they'll have multiple federations eventually, but that specific one, you know, spin on your sp spin up your own. You know, you, you can probably even pay them to to help you spin out your own. Um it, it's uh it's just really all up to you. Um but I, I think Blockstream should incentivize uh, others competing with them uh, so that this thing gets off the floor. Um, yeah, I think, uh, do you know Commerce Block? No idea. Um, I, I have a few issues with um, some design claims they're making. But other than that, like that that's another company doing... Um, stuff based on elements what is for tokens. this thing you mentioned you no idea it, it, it's just another uh side chain company using elements um but but their model is pretty much like every token has its own chain um and there, there's like no worrying about btc pegins but like i think that that is going to complement things perfectly because those those tokens that want to natively have their own chain can just kind of orbit around liquid and just go to Liquid to do any kind of wider interaction. And if you don't want that hassle, you can just natively issue it on Liquid. Yeah. Um, I guess. I, I mean, I, these things are not obvious to me yet. Like, I, I think, you know, it's sort of going to be like different sort of setups for different people for different needs. Um, I It's just, it's it's nice to see others trying, right? I think it's like the more the more people trying this stuff, the better it is. Mm -hmm. All right. So one one more question: When is Libra support coming? <laughs> um, it's funny. Uh so probably never. But uh, but I, you know, unlike many people, I actually like Libra. Uh, I think you can't be it's, friends anymore. Um, I I am all for you know non-state actors trying to make their own money. I think that's perfectly fair and reasonable. You know, Facebook does have a bit of a a size problem. <laughs> They're too big and they have too many people in it. I'm not in it, um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I think Facebook. Like this project has essentially the potential of teaching a whole generation that money does not have to be made by states, and and that on itself is worth all the shit that's gonna come with it because it's no. gonna be like surveillance insanity. But it's not like you already isn't anyways with you know when you use your Venmo or whatever the fuck. So like if you use any tool already that is sort of centralized digital money is already full on um, surveillance so you know if Facebook wants to uh, mass with a few sort of big monies in the world by all means uh, have fun can't, we can't be friends anymore were we friends before oh that that was that was, that was fucking Boom! mean that was mean. Burn. <laughs> Come on, Shinobi. Just warm up to it. Who cares? People should be free to do whatever they want. Except stupid things. I would prefer if they don't do stupid things. Yeah, that's a personal preference thing, you know? People, people you know, do their thing. And hopefully they learn from their mistakes. <laughs> We're all fucked. The world would be boring with us stupid things. Exactly. You know, hold my beer. 
that's why we're all <laughs> fucked. Alrighty. Well, I don't know, hey, uh... Napara, any any cool new stuff coming out on Wasabi? <laughs> yeah, I've been actually. I don't even want to mention it because I'm going to fail. But uh, the proper Bitcoin Core integration, I just started working on that. That would be nice. Cool. Um, yeah. Well, hopefully we're gonna have an HSM for you guys to try to use. Um, you know, with like a so like you can have a hot cold card for your mixing. Uh, and then maybe automatic automatically move those E two XOs to a cold one once they've been mixed. Yeah, you know, what I just realized is that I don't strictly need cold card support for mixing with hardware wallets because I could just send money to a key that I just generated in memory and quickly serialize the transaction that goes back to the court card assigned transaction i just don't broadcast it so yeah no that's totally that doable. memory would be on in sorry that key would be in memory and i could just mix it into the court into the hardware wallet and if if the computer shuts down or anything happens the signed transaction that goes back to the court card is there on the on the hard drive or something like that you could you could mess with this so, i don't know but it 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 uses more block space right that's that's my real problem right yeah i mean you could also pre-batch the transactions and then sort of sign them in this in the order that you need them to be signed uh it's it's not a simple problem uh doing this stuff without the device being connected <laughs> Oh, you, you you cannot because those because you don't know what to what transactions are going to happen, right? My point was that I send money to a key that I just generated in the memory, and I serialize the transaction that goes back to the hardware wallet. Yes, I just don't broadcast it. Yes, this is just a, just a safety transaction. If something something fucks up, if the coin join doesn't happen ever then we can still get back the money that's the point yeah that's pretty useful Woo! also yeah what, what do you think about keeping the key in in memory in the memory of the computer right you, you mean the private key no I just mean, the, yeah just or the any, any kind of any kind of secret right because yeah, no, everything you can't. goes through so, the memory yeah no it, it's it's a it, it's a clusterfuck of a stack right there, there really is no secure way of doing that uh i i don't think there is uh, i mean yeah, so, if it's if it's the x pub it doesn't matter right like i mean it just matters in terms of privacy but that's not real secure risk security risk um but I don't, I, I don't think you wanna carry. Well, one is that the the cold card is not gonna release the secret. <laughs> it's like by design, right? So there is no way of getting the private keys out. Um. So, so yeah, so that that wouldn't work that way. Yeah, I mean, and any time to you are writing a password into your computer, it's gonna go through the memory, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's it's completely outside the scope of this. Yeah, no, totally. That's exactly like uh, it's totally part of the issue, and that's why cold boot attacks are such a problem, right? Um, because you know, anyways, yeah, I, I, the computer is a disaster. It's a very complex thing, and if you just watch the net stat of a computer, is insane. I mean, any modern OS, it's like it's talking to like fifty fucking thousand like different domains you know every minute to even get fonts it's like it's a clusterfuck everything should be virtual machines inside virtual machines inside virtual machines yeah but the memory is still hard so you're still screwed uh that's one of the biggest issues is that like I don't think, at least not in anything that's available to the public uh that problem has been solved uh, in terms of, because the, the the memory for the virtual machine is still available to the to the metal, so 
And that's often how people get side channel attacked in data centers and stuff. Stateless hardware. Give me my yeah. stateless hardware. Yeah, that's that's how the, the HSMs we built for CoinKite way back in the day were. They were all read only. Uh, once you, you get the keys in there, it's set up, they're read only. Um, still, you know, there's still lots of risk there. It's like, dude, you, you need to read this paper, uh, Stateless Laptop. I forget who it's by. But, like, the entire architecture is literally, like, every chip on a device should be RAM. Except for the read-only source that it pulls all its fucking firmware and code from. And that yeah, that's except, everything should work yeah, like that. Yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't work like that anymore. Because, you know, the microphone on the laptop is going to have a DSP chip. And the DSP chip has memory on it. And then the, 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 the chip that controls the fans. You know, everything, like there's the, the complexity of I the agree hardware with is you. just mind boggling. It's stupid and it should yeah, stop. And let's go back to stateless. Let's make everything stateless. Like, stop being stupid. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think it's, uh, we, we can go back to that either because the complexity of the interactions make it too hard to make it stateless. Then I'm going to go, I'm going to go live in the woods. Bye, guys. Exactly. You know, when uh, when hyper Bitcoinization happens, you know, the world's going to be falling apart, too. We can all just uh, go raise sheep. Yeah, keep calm and use Windows. No. Vomit. <laughs> Vomit. Oh, I was just screaming at Windows. This laser machine we got needs Windows. Oh, my God. It's awful. Yeah, I know no part is just crazy like that. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else uh, you guys want to talk about? I think I pretty much pulled us through everything I wanted to go over. Yeah, I'm good. So I have to take down the trash. Yep. I am. Uh, I got to go. All right. So, Rodolfo, uh, I'll, I'll get you my address so you can send me that free block clock. And uh, we're all done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Two weeks. All right, uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for uh, coming on again, Rodolfo. It's always fun talking to you. And I guess uh, we'll see you next time, punks. Later. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's a good idea, so I'm going